The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the eighth chapter. To the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves to anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Today is Reformation Sunday. It is a high holy day for those of us who belong to the Lutheran clan of Christianity. It is the day when we remember the namesake of our church, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther, and him nailing the 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now this nailing, which probably took about 20 seconds, and probably went unnoticed for some time, led to a world-changing event called the Reformation. And this event was so important in the life of the world that Martin Luther was named the third most important person of the last millennium by the History Channel. And the battle cry of the Reformation could often be served up uh, in, the pra- in the phrase, Uber Alice. Maybe not. Maybe not. That's not quite right. It's something else. The battle cry could be summarized with the phrase, we are saved by grace through faith. I mean, you will hear this statement over and over again in Lutheran churches throughout the world. <clears throat> but for some, particularly those outside of the church, it has raised some deep questions. For instance, in a Facebook conversation that I was (coughs) observing, an atheist asked the question, Save from what? Save from what indeed? Sometimes I wonder if we know the answer to this question. And perhaps we should take some time to explore this question as we celebrate Reformation Sunday. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, gracious God, we thank you that you are always calling us to reform our lives so that we may become closer and closer to being like Jesus. We also give you thanks that you are constantly calling the church to reform, to become closer and closer to your word. As we celebrate this Reformation Sunday, we pray that we may always be reforming to grow into the image and likeness of your Son, and be the people you have called us to be. And we ask this in your name. Amen. There was once a small town that had two boys in it who were notorious troublemakers. The parents had tried everything to get their kids to behave. They took them to doctors. They took them to counselors. They took them to psychiatrists. They even took them to school principals, and nothing worked. So finally they decided they would take him to the local hellfire and brimstone preacher to see what he might be able to do. And the preacher agreed to meet with the boys, but he said he wanted to do so individually. So first he met with little Bill. And he sat at his desk reading his book, and Bill sat on the other side of his desk in a chair. And the preacher looked over his glasses at him kind of like this. And he said, Bill, where is God? And little Bill started to squirm a little bit. The preacher put his book down, sat up a little straighter, glared across his desk at Bill and said a little louder, Bill, where is God? Little Bill really started to squirm. Then the preacher stood up, slammed his fist down on either side of his desk, raised his voice and said, Bill, where is God? I did that just a little too well, didn't I? (laughs) Well, little Bill was freaked out at that point. I mean, he jumped up, he bolted out the church. 
he ran down the street as fast as he could. He ran to his friend Dave's house, ran into the backyard where Dave was playing, and he went in there yelling. He said, Dave, Dave, we've done and gone it now. We done really messed up. God is missing, and they think that we took him. <laughs> now... Of course, of course, the pastor wasn't suggesting that God was missing. I mean, instead, he was really trying to put the fear of God into little Billy and then into Dave. But here's the question that I have for you based on this little joke. Who really fears God today? I mean, really. When you look at society and, and what is going on in the world around us, and when you think about the people who you meet on a regular basis... Do you know anyone who really, truly fears God? You see, I'm, I'm not sure that I know anyone who really does at all. In fact, most folks that I know have no fear of God whatsoever. They oftentimes say that God is love and God affirms me. God is my friend and my companion. God wants to bless me and care for me. And, and if you talk to the folks who are spiritual but not religious... And if, if you're one of those folks who is here worshiping with us today, I'm genuinely thankful for your presence. Because I appreciate what you have to say to myself and other Christians, because you, oftentimes you say that you have had these wonderful experiences where you have felt the presence of God and you have felt deeply loved and deeply affirmed. And I think this is a tremendously good thing. Because God is a God of love and acceptance and beauty. The scriptures tell us so, and probably one of the most famous places they tell us this is in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. It reads this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. Indeed, God is love. And some would argue that this is the only message that we need to tell people about God. That God loves them. And God certainly does. But I think we do a disservice to God by simply announcing to folks that God loves them. Because God, being a God of love, also means that God hates certain things. Now that may cause you to scratch your head a little bit, but please hear me out. I'm going to do so by sharing with you an example. One of the most terrible things that is happening in our world today is young girls being taken out of their homes or kidnapped from their families and forced into sexual slavery. These girls are being exploited, dehumanized, and brutalized by people longing to satisfy their sexual urges and by those who are wanting to make money. Their oppressors do not care about their well-being. They don't care about these girls' hearts and minds. They only care about their wallets. And sometimes the effects are devastating. Just this week, I read a Facebook article about a 15-year-old girl. 15-year-old girl. She was from Houston. She was rescued from sex trafficking. But the damage and things that had happened to her drove her to commit suicide. That's horrible. And, and here's the brutal fact that most of those who engage in sex trafficking business are never brought to justice. Most of the folks who kidnap girls, who abuse girls, who throw them away like garbage, never face a judge, jury, or jail time. They walk away scot-free, oftentimes living lives of luxury. That's just the facts. That's the reality of the world. And here's the question I have for that. What does God think about this? When God looks down from His throne in heaven, what does He think about those who do such horrendous things to young girls? Does He sit on that throne and say to Himself, Oh, it's okay. I love them. They're just misguided. Everything will be okay. Do you think God does that? Do you think God looks upon such injustice and is unmoved? What do you think? Yes or no? No. God's anger is kindled. His wrath burns hot. 
because love demands anger. And you know this. You know it deeply. Parents, you know it because if someone attempts to hurt your child or is hurting your child, you know that there is this fire that begins to burn deeply within you and it is not satisfied until your children are no longer hurting. And even if you're not a parent, you know it too. Because you know that same fire burns within you when you see someone hurting someone you love. And that fire does not go away until someone is brought to justice. Until those who have perpetrated the events pay for their crimes. And you see, God is no different. You see, sometimes folks have an awfully hard time with some of the things that are, they read in the Old Testament. They read about God's actions towards certain groups, how God sometimes rains down fire and brimstone upon them. And they ask, how could such a loving God do such a terrible thing? Well, if you read what those people were doing, how some of them were sacrificing their children and burning them alive to an idol, how some of them were exploiting the poor and selling people just to make a buck. When you read about some of the other unspeakable, unmentionable things that these people were doing, you would understand. Because God is punishing those who sin against them and against the creation that He loves. God is pouring out His wrath and judgment upon those who repeatedly broken His commands despite His attempts at warning. Because all through the scriptures, God does not punish until he warns and warns and warns again. The scripture tells us that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he certainly is. But his anger always becomes kindled against sin. And I think too many people have forgotten this. Too many people have not held in balance God's love with God's justice and holiness. Too many people have forgotten how much God hates sin. Now think of you, think of it is, some of you start <laughs> begin making a conclusion. You start might be making a connection, going, wait a minute here, Pastor Kevin. Are are you suggesting that when we sin, God becomes angry with us? Are you suggesting that when we sin, God will punish us? Are you suggesting that if we are sinners, that we are deserving of God's punishment and wrath? Well, first off, let it be clear. I'm not the one who's suggesting this. Because if it were up to me, I wouldn't put this stuff out here. I don't want to talk about God's wrath and anger. Because when you talk about this stuff, you get people angry with you. And really, I don't want people to be angry with me. I want people to like me. After I'm done today, I want everybody to come up on my, uh, and slap me on the back and say, Pastor Howe, wonderful sermon. I really like how you made me feel. <laughs> That's what I want. But I'm not called to preach about who I would like God to be. I'm called to preach about who God is. And here's what the Bible says God is. From the book of Romans chapter 1, we read, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what, be may, be, what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. That is not something fun to hear. And I could go on with several other quotations from the Bible, but the Bible is not the only source that tells us and reminds us of this. As I said earlier, Martin Luther had a few words to say about this. From his commentary on the book of Galatians, he says, We are the offending party. God is the party offended. The offense is of such a nature that God cannot pardon it, Neither can we render adequate satisfaction for our offenses. There is discord between God and us. He goes on to say, When sin, death, and the wrath of God are revealed to a person by the law, he grows impatient, complains against God, and rebels. Before that, he was a very holy man. He worshipped and praised God. He bowed his knees before God and gave thanks. But now that sin and death are revealed to him by the law, he wishes there were no God. The law inspires hatred of God. Thus, sin is not only revealed by the law, sin is actually increased and magnified by the law. The law is a mirror to show a person what he is like, a sinner who is guilty of death and worthy of everlasting punishment. 
Oh, jeez. Why can't I just preach that God is love? Why can't I just preach that God loves you and cares for you and longs to give you the deepest desires of your heart? Why can't I just preach that God wants to give you your best life now? You know, you can grow huge churches and sell tons of books and make a lot of money by saying that message. The question is, is it the true message? Is it the true message of the gospel? No, it's not. Because, because it is only when you realize that you are a sinner, it is only when you realize that you stand condemned, it is only when you realize that you deserve eternal punishment that you can then see the beauty, the wonder, the graciousness, and the awesomeness of the gospel. It is only when you see how unholy that you are in comparison to the holiness of God that your heart leaps when you hear the words, you are saved by grace. Or as our second lesson says, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but they are now justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forward as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood, effective through faith. And what Scripture is telling us is that instead of God's punishment falling on us, instead of us having to bear the weight of our own sins, God became human. Jesus became God in flesh who lived the life that we should have lived. And then He died the death that we deserved. The punishment that we deserved fell on Jesus as He atoned for our sins. And again, I want to quote Martin Luther in his commentary to the book of Galatians. Listen carefully. He says, Christ is personally innocent. Personally, he did not deserve to be hanged for any crime of his own doing. But because Christ took the place of others who were sinners, he was hanged like any other transgressor. The law of Moses leaves no loopholes. It says that a transgressor should be hanged. Who are the other sinners? We are. The sentence of death and everlasting damnation had long been pronounced over us, but Christ took all our sins and died for them on the cross. Jesus died for you. And He died for me on that cross. Jesus took the punishment that was intended for you and me. And He gave us the reward that He had earned. And this is what makes grace so amazing. This is what bewilders the mind. To think that God would take the punishment that I deserved. Who can comprehend such a sacrifice without becoming full of awe and wonder and amazement? Because this is how we are saved. We are saved from the wrath that God should have poured out on us. Not by our actions. Not by what we do. But because of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And again, you know, I am not making this stuff up on my own accord. I mean, you've heard me say over and over that Christianity is not primarily about what we do, but it is primarily about what God has done in Jesus Christ. Where do you think I get this from? Martin Luther! Who quoted... I must listen to the gospel for it tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. We need to read that together. I must listen to the gospel. It tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. Because when you see, when you have the proper fear of God, the fear that you have sinned and deserve punishment. And then you hear the gospel and you understand what God has done. You experience this marvelous transformation. Or dare I say this marvelous reformation in your life. You experience a deep, deep sense of peace and well-being. You experience a lasting sense of joy that may dim at some times, but it is always there. You have less anger and praise comes readily to your lips. Daily you find something that fills you with awe and wonder as you are reminded of the undeserved love that you have experienced. When grace becomes amazing, your life is changed. One final quote from Luther to underscore this point. 
our conscience is free and quiet because it no longer has to fear the wrath of God. This is real liberty, compared with which every other kind of liberty is not worth mentioning. Who can adequately express the boon that comes to a person when he has the hard assurance that God will never more be angry with him, but will forever be merciful to him for Christ's sake? Who can express it indeed? It is something that is almost too great for words. It is something that is almost beyond comprehension. And it is news beyond compare. You are saved by God's wondrous, marvelous, amazing grace. Thanks be to God. Amen. We hope you have been blessed by this presentation from Bethany Lutheran Church in Fredericksburg. We invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 8, 1025, or 1030 a.m. Please like, share, and subscribe this video so that you can help spread the good news of Jesus Christ.